thing that um, the thing that the kind of the engine that rebuilt Europe, the, the the place where Europe woke back up and and, and learned how to read, learned how to became literate once again, uh, and where business started to, to happen once again and trade, where how it picked itself back up was through the monastery. Monasteries were built in this context of chaos as as a literally like a military unit, um, as if it could wage war if it wanted to. But the point was it was walled in. It was hard to, to it was as, as impregnable as possible. So it could be this island of order, of calm, of beauty, of, of meditation, where people could save their souls. Man, that was, you know, in a world of chaos, it's, it, that's what matters. Uh, and so the idea was transcendence. And worship was transcendent. It was a way to put you in a place uh, um, of access to God, of, of the deity, um, where you could be with him, it, or whatever. Um, uh, and, and so, okay, so, so unceasing worship was the goal. And almost all of it was sung. You didn't really speak much of anything. Even the readings were sung. You, you sang them, probably so you could be heard. Okay. So these islands of calm worship. So that that's what's going on here. So we get get a little bit deeper here. So okay, to get into the critical. So now we understand the history. We understand understand the context. So we understand now that um, in terms of transcendence. So they associate just as we do today, music with a strong beat, with moving, dancing. I mean, whether you get up and actually dance or not. Whether you're just kind of like you know wrapping your hand on the steering wheel as you drive down the road, you move, you move. Music moves you. In fact, it's something that 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 we only discovered fairly recently. Scientists are learning a lot about the brain and how it processes music, and it it, it is astounding what how it's revealing the way our mind works. Not just music, but really our mind, the way it works. Um, and they found that the parts of your brain that fire when you're moving when you're actually dancing, are the same parts that fire even when you're just sitting still listening to music. I mean, think about that. So the sounds coming in your ears fire your brain just as if you were actually moving. The implications of that, they're still trying to untangle what that all means. But anyway, back to this. They associated strong rhythm and instruments with secular music, dance music, and actually, even more specifically, pagan celebrations. Pagans celebrated their had their big festivals um, uh, throughout the year, and there was dancing and singing and and, and cavorting and you know all, all the rest. And so to separate themselves from that, they they they, they created this music that that didn't have those elements. Um, but also in terms of unity, you know, this was a family. You, when you lived in the monastery. Um, you, you really, those were your brothers or your sisters if you were in a convent. Um, throughout your life, you lived there, ate there, worked there, grew your food there, and died there, usually. Um, I had a friend in graduate school who had just left the monastery. He was in his mid-60s, and he decided to go get a mag uh, master's degree. He actually left because uh, they, they, they refused to let him learn uh, Russian. Well, church Russian, it's called Slavonic, so that he could do some translations uh, of some ancient documents that they would not let him. And after, de after decades, he left, went to the monastery right after high school um, and had been there his whole life. And so it was like leaving his family that he would never see again. Anyway, so, but, so in terms of the music, when I said there was no harmony, there's a reason for that. This is music that all can sing together. Uh, it's simple and it's monophonic. So monophonic is the term we use um, for music that has just one melody, no harmony at, at all. So, okay. All right, so, so Vidar and Omnes, let's return to this particular chant. This, you might have noticed that um, certain syllables, certain words were drawn out, uh, and lots and lots of notes for that one syllable. That's because this is a melismatic chant. Uh, melismatic, a melisma is just exactly what I described. It's, it's a moment where you have a melodic gesture of three, of three or more notes. It could be five, six, seven, 15, 25 notes for one syllable, that one syllable. Um, 
and it's it, they tend to be on on the most important words. So let's hear an example. About halfway through the chant, um, you'll hear the word Dominus, Lord, and on Do of, of Dominus, you'll hear this this just flowering of melody. It's it's just you know this is uh, worship. This is worship of the Lord who is uh, you know, rejoicing. It says it says Jubilate Deo. All the earth rejoice uh, in the Lord. Uh, this is how you rejoiced in the Middle Ages. So, all right, so, so why, you know, what's that all about? Okay, so it's, it's again, you know, it's very easy, um, and this is just really too, true of all learning. It's easy to just, like, okay, there's the term, it's melismatic, I wrote it down, like, fine, what, I know what that means. But again, why? What's the point? You know, so they just like to do that, whatever, mix it up a little, you know. Yeah, true. Um, that was their way of marking that chant, that moment, as, as a very, very important moment in the service. It's a little bit like if you've seen medieval manuscripts that have the decorations or like take even just like a capital letter and just fill it, almost obscuring the letter itself with, with decoration. Um, in a little, it's called an illumination, illumin an illuminated manuscript. Well, it's, in a sense, we're illuminating the, the words of the chant um, with, this, with this melisma. So it's, it's uh, highly decorative, highly ornate, just like uh, illuminated manuscripts, um, and it, it marks this very important moment when when we are about to hear the gospel reading itself. Again, really the high point of the service. Okay, so I want to switch gears for a second and talk about a, a musical milestone um, that uh, from the 800s that really sets the set the West apart from many other cultures. And without making a value judgment um, about what's better or worse in, in this regard, um, we can at least say that uh, it, it made the West different, it made our music different. And, and if I wanted to say something pretty simple, pretty straightforward about this, you know, part of the reason that we have uh, symphonies by people like Beethoven that are half an hour long, written on paper, uh, you know, written on in manuscript paper, is because of something that happened in the ninth century. A um, little bit of background here. Every church at that time, through m much of the Middle Ages, um, up to the ninth century, worshipped differently. I mean, it was it was a big empire. I mean, it, you know, it was the, the, the area it covered was, was large. And many different kinds of people from many different backgrounds, um, some bringing in their own traditions from other religions sometimes, you know, um, kind of mixing it together a little bit. Uh, and so the, the text they used, the songs they sang, they were all different. Well, in order for the church to have any kind of identity as a cohesive whole, um, the church leaders decided that really they needed to all be worshiping in a much more uniform way. The question is, um, so they wanted this uniformity. The question is, how do you do that? What, what that would involve is, so you pick one liturgy, it's called one one way of worshiping one so so they can be official it's like a hymn, a hymn book like here are the hymns we will sing here are the songs we will sing here are the words here are the tunes but but at this time it was all done by ear nothing was written down through most of the middle ages really throughout human history music really was not written down it was something you did by ear that's why, um, for instance, in the, in the from the ancient world, from like the ancient Greeks, we have these incredible sculptures, these te their temples, you know, the Parthenon and and, and it's it, etc. In terms of music, we have almost nothing, nothing. We have almost no idea really what music was like in the Greek in the ancient world. There are a couple of fragments. I mean, there's just a few examples, and they're they're all fragmentary. They're, they're incomplete um, of actual notation. 
Well, in the ninth century in, in the West, um, they decided to write it down, to come up with some system of, of writing the notes down that they heard. So, okay, so at first, um, as you can see uh, at the upper right there, what they, what they did was they just kind of wrote little squiggles that showed the general direction. This is called pneumatic notation. Those are neums. Each of those little squiggles is called a neum. And so it just showed the general direction of the melody. And, and actually, at this point, it still was just kind of as a, as a reminder. You still, they still did a lot by ear, but it was to kind of a remind you of how it went. Well, it wasn't until the turn of the millennium, until um, the, the about, you can think of about the year 1000, it was a little after that, but the 11th, early 11th century when they actually started um, using a four-line staff. So really, the turn of the millennium, you can think of it in that way, is when really for the first time, precise notation was possible. You knew you could just hand someone a sheet of manuscript paper and they could read it off the page just like they would read uh, any other, like a book. You know, um, so, okay. So this is, this is huge because what they're going to start doing next is they're going to start building on the chant. They're going to start elaborating it. Uh, as elaborate as that chant is, they want to make it even more elaborate. What if you're worshiping at uh, in, in, the, in the 12th century, you're in Paris, which at that time was really the cultural capital of the world, well, of the West. It was the cultural capital of the West. It had the, arguably the first university. It had a, a famous, famous cathedral, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral. And so you had a lot of money there, a lot of businessmen living in, in Notre Dame. By this time, trade had happened, had, had uh, appeared again. So anyway, okay, so this is a rich church a lot of parishioners, um, and so music there, worship there, is going to be really, really special. Now notice I, I, I mentioned Paris. We're not talking about a monastery anymore. We're not talking about a monastery anymore. We can think of the Middle Ages as kind of dividing around uh, the 12th century. Um, from about 11, before about 1150, the mid-12th century, we think of this as the age of the monastery. These are churches, um, that were in this remote, these remote settings out in the wilderness um, some, a lot of times, but not always, but, but the idea was they were set apart. Um, from about 1150 on, um, we, we can think of this as the age of the cathedral. The cathedral, the cathedral is a city church, it's, so it's for an urban population. It's where the bishop is. You know, the bishop for that, it's called a diocese for that area, is at that church. So usually that's where the money is anyway, because uh, that's a, she's a church leader for that whole area, overseeing all the other churches in that area. Okay, so the cathedral. Uh, it's not really the size of the church or anything physical about it that makes it, it makes it a cathedral, it's just where the bishop is. Now, so 12th century cities, you probably know, in the, in the Middle Ages, you know, um, were not pretty. They were crowded, extremely crowded, extremely noisy, ugly, smelly places, where you dumped your garbage out onto the street from the top story of your building, and you just, if you're on the street, you just gotta like look out below. I mean, just, you know, garbage, refuse, everything, you know. Um, so there was at this time, you know, as these cities grew, kind of started to appear again, they had all become just kind of a backwater throughout most, much of the Middle Ages. They just, they just were kind of overgrown, uh, people had carted away a lot of the stone that was used in the in the, the, the old Roman buildings for other things, and so anyway, by the 12th century, so there was this yearning for among everyday people for for beauty, for for spirituality, and the church responded with an architectural style that is still famous. It was the first new architectural style in. In for what uh, for about 1600 years really since the ancient Greeks or since the ancient Romans uh, it was the first new architectural style and it was the what we now call the Gothic style 